I realise that the title Neurodevelopmental Specialist probably isn't a very helpful one. Um, I don't quite fit very neatly into the box of a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Um, I specialise in doing diagnostic assessments for autism and ADHD. Um, and I'm currently based in the Maudsley um, Adult Service for Autism and ADHD. Um, but I've also worked a lot with children. Um, I'm also a psychotherapist um, and I work a lot in prisons and also at the National Autism Unit, which is an inpatient unit for adults with autism. Um, so I, sort of, I do lots of bits and bobs. Um, and I became interested in this topic um, actually through a lot of my work with adults um, and the idea of um, ADHD and the development of self identity. Because for many of the adults that um, <coughs> are newly diagnosed, and we sometimes don't diagnose people until quite late on in their life, um, many of them will say, I, I wish I'd known, I wish I'd known this before. Um, I do, you know, and as a sort of way to make sense of themselves and who they are. And I think it's quite a, a sort of neglected topic in many ways. Um, a lot of the time there's a focus on you know, the treatment in terms of um, pharm uh, pharmaceutical treatment or um, psychological treatment. Um, and a lot of the time people don't think about this and what it means um, for people to get the diagnosis and how it shapes the way they view themselves and who they are as a person. And also within that, that when people start to take medication and how that might um, change the way they feel about themselves uh, and impact on how they see themselves as a whole. So that's the basis of, of this, and I'm, um, I'll be interested to um, hear what you think later on when we do uh, the question and answer session. So I started off, and actually um, there is a huge amount out there about how self-concept is defined um, and self-identity, and I ended up getting rather distracted by the philosophy of it all, which I won't go into tonight because we could be here forever. Um, but really, this is what I'm thinking about. When I talk about the self-concept, uh, concept, I'm thinking about the self-image, which is how people perceive themselves, so how they view um, who they are. And the ideal self um, is about who they'd like to be, um, of what qualities they see that um, they would like to be like. And the self-esteem is looking at the sort of gap between these two. Um, and, th and that feeds into the, to the self-concept. I think it's hugely important in ADHD because um, there's a lot. I think a lot of people experience negative feedback from others when they aren't able to do things that other kids seem to be able to do quite easily. Um, I think it's hugely important to um, look at some of the positive aspects as well, um, rather than the things that they struggle with and can't do. So I'm interested in how ADHD fits in with this, fits in with it, the self-concept. Um, now, people, this development of self-concept, I think, starts from day one, really. Um, right from when kids are young, they start to learn about themselves and how they are separate from other people. And it starts off in a, in a very, very basic way. Um, so they'll realise that um, if they hurt themselves, if they fall over, it will hurt them. If someone else falls over, unless they fall onto them, it's not going to hurt them. So it's a way that people start to realise that they are separate from other objects and people around them. And they'll also start to learn that, um, and on a very basic level, first of all, that their actions will have consequences. So things like pushing this here, it will move. This is the kind of most basic way that people start to realise, I am, I am me and I'm different from the other things around me. And as we get older, um, we start to develop more of a self-concept. And initially that tends to be very concrete. So... Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a girl, or I am this age, or I am this height, uh, I've got this hair colour. Um, and so it starts off in a very concrete way. And then as we grow and develop, um, we start to, to identify more with some of the abstract concepts. Um, and we start to compare with other people. And that helps us kind of gauge where we are, um, whether it's a conscious thing or not. Um, and this is the kind of bit I'm really interested in in relation to ADHD, um, how people identify their personality traits, how interlinked they are with ADHD as a condition, um, and, where, and where the comparative evaluations come in. Okay? Um, and then also the, implica the implications of the medication on that as well, I think it's an interesting one. Um, I'm amazed actually when I work therapeutically how difficult people, well anybody, not just people with ADHD or autism, but how difficult people find it to describe themselves. Um, and it can be really hard because it's often not a question that, that people are asked. 
Um, so I'm quite interested in people making sense of themselves. I do quite a lot of work with personality disorder as well, and that's often a key feature of that. I don't know if any of you are familiar with personality disorder, um, but there's what they call a sort of fragmented sense of self. Many of us have a, a consistent um, way that they would describe themselves, and that doesn't change so much over time. But some people really struggle because they at one point feel like one person, one point feel like another person. And I think this can happen in ADHD sometimes. <coughs> So as we all know, ADHD is with us from, right from dot. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I'm interested in um, the relationship between ADHD and self-identity. If somebody has, um, develops a, um, a condition like depression later on, they may well have established a self-identity. And then that they are, um, they are incorporating um, depression into that in a certain period of their life. So they can see themselves for a time before they were depressed. It's different from that um, in ADHD because ADHD has always been part of the person. Um, so the, the self concept develops in the context of ADHD. <coughs> all of the struggles, all the challenges, and all the brilliant, wonderful bits as well. Okay. Um, and it's often around the teenage years that people start to um, understand some of the more complex aspects. Um, of self-concept and self-identity. I like to include this slide. Um, I had to try and crowbar it in while I can because I think it's wonderful. Um, this is from a very, very bright teenager that I work with um, who has both autism and ADHD. Um, and he likes to write things down. And so he wanted to descri describe to me how he sees development. Um, and this is how he did it. And I was very interested in the... Uh, the adulthood being 19 to 40, <laughs> and the senior adulthood being 40 to 60. I'm not sure how many of you will agree with that. And then he sort of realised that he'd, he'd run out, and then he had to invent a new one, which is senior year. So, sort of, but I just think it's brilliant because because what we did actually we talked around what it means to transition between the categories that he was thinking about, um, and it's just yet yeah, another wonderful example of how you know other people might see childhood, adolescence, adulthood, um, and someone with a different perspective. Um, I've seen it like this. Um, so we, you know, we've talked about what's the difference between these stages. How do you know when you're going through these stages? From his point of view, his perspective. I did have to disagree with him about this bit. <laughs> so I'm not. <laughs> um, we do know that um, even if people don't retain the full <coughs> diagnostic criteria that they had during childhood, 15% um, do continue around 50%. Uh, 15%, this is from the study here, um, continue to meet the full diagnostic criteria of 25. Um, and a further 50% continue to suffer impairment from residual symptoms of ADHD. Um, so people are the majority of people are continuing to, to struggle with, um, with the symptoms in a way that it causes other impairment. It is a neurodevelopmental disorder, so um, <coughs> it is going to be there even if the symptoms go to that point that's just below the diagnostic threshold. You know, it's a, it's a sort of, um, a, can be a fairly arbitrary line sometimes about um, when people are either side of the line of diagnos diagnosis or not. And we also know, um, as many of you will, that the symptoms can change as well. So um, as people get older, um, the symptoms might look different, they'll change and develop. It doesn't mean they're disappearing, they might take a different form. Um, and this uh, is an example of some of the um, hyperactive impulsive uh, symptoms that sometimes, not always, sometimes um, they appear on the outside to settle down a bit. But actually what happens is people become more socially aware, they realise they have to, they can't sit in their uh, I don't know, meeting at work being as hyperactive as they were um, as a child, so they suppress it. It doesn't mean it's gone away, it just takes a different form and often turns into this increased um, internal restlessness because they haven't got anywhere um, to sort of express that. So I think it's really important to think that, to understand and get a sense of how the symptoms might change. And also that has a bearing on the way people perceive themselves and their self-identity as well. I think this is, I mean, it's confusing enough as it is if you think about certainly teenage years going through trying to work out who am I, you know, pushing the boundaries. Um, and when you throw in the, the challenges um, of ADHD, and I think... It's particularly difficult um, in a school environment because some of the things that 
the main things that the kids are expected to do are more difficult for children with ADHD. Sit down, concentrate, and do, you know, those things are really tricky. So when kids are trying to work out who they are as a person, who they are in relation to their peers, this is one that they're spending a huge amount of time at school. Uh, so this is some of the comparative, um, you know, the comparisons that they make when it's with their peers. I'm guessing that everyone's here because they um, know somebody or care about somebody, love somebody who's got ADHD. Is that a fair assumption? Okay. Yeah. So what I'd like you to do is just in your mind, we can that if you want to, think of three words um, to describe a person that you know and love with ADHD. Just the first three words that come into your mind about them as a person. I'll give you a few minutes because I know it's not an easy thing to do. Misunderstood. people got an idea, or at least one. And what I want you to do is think about how those three words that come into your mind, whether any of them, all of them, a couple of them, relate in some way to the symptoms of ADHD. Some of them may do, some of them may not. But I know that for speaking for lots of people therapeutically who have ADHD, a lot of the way that they describe themselves, some of the key ways that they identify um, themselves, are related in some way to their ADHD symptoms. You know, a lot of people might say, oh, I'm really scatty, oh, I'm forgetful, you know, these kind of things. Um, because they've had a lot of messages, a lot of people telling me this over the years. Um, and it's very easy to take on board those things, and they form part of the, the self-concept, and forget about those brilliant things, you know, the energy, the, you know, all of those wonderful things, that, you know, different thinking, um, all of that. Um, so I think that's important, and actually, when I'm working with um, when I'm working with anyone really, kids or adults, or people with and without neurodevelopmental disorders, when people are struggling with this, I've got a whole load of cards that I have, and I lay them out and say, "All right, I want you to divide these into three. There's lots of descriptions of personality traits, things I'm good at, whole big selection. So I'd like you to do three piles. Uh, one pile that you think is true of you. One pile that you think is definitely not true of you." and one part that's the, you're not sure, or you a bit of both. Um, and then I get them to pick out from the things that are true of them, the bits that they like. It's a lot of a kind of mixture of, I don't really want to say positive and negative personality traits because I don't think of it in that way, um, but the things that they like about themselves. And it's, it's just a bit easier when you're working therapeutically for people to have those in front of them. And it also helps when you've got goals as well because I get them to also pick the things that they're not, that they'd like to be. So, okay, what from what you've got here that you say definitely not true? Any of them that you'd like to be true of you? And then we can explore that. Um, it's just a good way, I think, to help people think about themselves, what they think about themselves, and also to help people recognise that everyone's got bits about themselves that they might not be so keen on, and everyone's got bits of themselves that are brilliant. And skills as well, skills and difficulties. Sometimes I feel like I just want to come out and watch me parallel park just so they can see my, my, <laughs> one of my many, many deficits. Um, and, you know, maths and things. And I will, you know, I sort of share those things and think, look, I like talking to people um, or I like doing this, but I'm really rubbish at maths. Um, you know, and just to say, hey, we've all got bits that we're good at, we've all got bits we struggle with. Um, and let's focus on the good bits as well as the challenges. This is not going to be news to any of you, but um, a lot. When I'm just thinking about these personality traits and ways to describe themselves, ways people think about the self-concept, um, many of these will will feed into the words that people use to describe themselves, uh, whether it's said out loud or it's what's said to them. And this a lot of the time as well. Many of you will have heard of the big five personality traits. I mean, I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but I just thought it was an interesting thing to highlight because even looking at these five here, um, you know, you've got a lot of these actually um, are influenced by ADHD symptoms. Um, things like, you know, conscientiousness, efficient, organised, um, easygoing, careless. You know, that, I mean, in terms of ADHD, that's very sort of, ADHD is very related to some of these things. Outgoing and energ energetic, um, you know, I just think that there's a lot of these things that are, you know, people are measuring themselves and other people, um, and ADHD has a role in that. Um, 
this is I think this is a really um, important thing to bring up because this is looking this is a, what the diva uh, which you may have heard of is a diagnostic interview for ADHD in adults and that's one of the diagnostic tools that we use when we're diagnosing adults um, and this is part of the diagnosis um, section so it's looking at impact on on people's lives uh, and it you know it looks at sort of functioning and this I've put, included this because um, this comes up so frequently there's um, uncertainty through negative comments of others negative self-image due to experience of failure fear of failure in terms of starting new things excessive intense excessive intense reaction to criticism perfectionism which often doesn't quite seem to make sense with ADHD but actually I see it a lot um, and distress by the symptoms of ADHD so this is trying to capture how ADHD has impacted upon people's um, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-image over time. This is another um, diagnostic, um, both of these are free actually, um, another diagnostic assessment which has been recently developed by Susan Young which is called the ACE Plus, there's one for children which is called ACE and one for adults which is called ACE Plus um, and this actually um, takes into account self-confidence and self-image in relation to some of the individual symptoms. Um, so it might be that some, some aspects of ADHD impact negatively, others not so much. But I think it's really key to um, raise this because it does become part of assessing the impact. Just had to include Kevin from... This is getting... Uh, this is fairly old now. I didn't realise when it first came out. It was quite a while ago. Um, I'm... I've um, brought this in because um, adolescence is so much this time with, with making sense of who we are, um, pushing the boundaries, um, <coughs> and throwing ADHD I think is very complicated. Um, there's also this idea about the transition which I wanted to raise. Um, because when you're, when you're a child and you're diagnosed, the professionals <coughs> tend to liaise with young children, understandably, directly with the adults. Now sometimes what happens, if the transition is not managed very well, um, it sort of flips straight from the child to, um, to, sorry, straight from interacting with the parents to interacting with the young person. And what can happen is that young person hasn't been very used to dealing with their own, their own care. They haven't been used to liaising with the professionals or making decisions about themselves. And it's not, as we know, people wake up on their 18th birthday and they suddenly have this wonderful insight into how to do all of these things. This transition needs to be managed. Um, and that's hugely important when it comes to medication. Because many people will see medication as something that highlights them be from being different from their peers at a time when they really want to fit in. Now, if a child hasn't got an understanding of how the medication works, what it's for, what it means, what's it doing in the brain, um, their options, so, you know, to know that they can take it for some medication for a short period of time, um, some can build up over a long period of time, then they might just say, I don't want this, I don't want anything that makes me different, I don't want anything that makes me feel like I'm, I'm different from my peers. Um, and as they get older, that becomes much more their decision. Whereas previously, it's, it's, you know, the parents have much more of a say in that. So what I'm, I'm very focused on is um, psychoeducation of kids and whatever level that they can access that. So it might be um, showing them a picture of a brain and saying, hey, this is how it works. I, I do this quite a lot in therapeutic work, actually. Um, and I did it with um, a, girl, a very bright um, young, I say young, young man who I said, oh, you know, have you, do you do much about the brain at school? because um, I'm going to show him what happens with medication in the brain on a fairly basic level. And he said, Emma, are you trying to talk to me about cognitive neuroscience? <laughs> <laughs> I, I pitched this very, very badly. Um, but if kids know that um, something might be working a little bit differently in the brain, um, the medication does this in the brain, um, it can be helpful. Sometimes you might want to take it when you need it. You don't have to have it all the time. Um, if they have more of an understanding of how it works, why it works, and this can be pitched at a very basic level or a hugely complex level that's way above my head, because um, I'm not a psychiatrist, 
But I think that's really important in, in terms of the de development of themselves, in feeling like they have a say in who they are, feeling like they have a choice and things aren't um, just being, the decisions aren't being made for them. Oh, here we are. This was my son. Um, prescription, this is in males only. I don't have any data for females, unfortunately. I've um, dropped by 95% between 15 and 21 years. Thinking back to the previous slide, when well, we know that 15% um, retain the full diagnosis, a further 50% have continuing symptoms which cause impairment. That is a vast majority, the vast, you know, the majority of people. Yet the medication um, is dropped by 95%. Now I'm not saying everyone should keep taking medication forever. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I do think is important is that kids from an early age, as early as they can access it, have an understanding so that they are informed to make their own choices, and that they can be involved in that decision-making process. I was quite, I was really struck by that. I think it's a really, really uh, interesting and important message. As you will already know, there are lots of um, comorbid difficulties that go alongside ADHD. It's quite rare for somebody to get to the ADHD clinic um, as, as an adult and not have a diagnosis during adulthood and not have an additional difficulty. Um, whether it be anxiety, depression, I work a lot with people who have both autism and ADHD, masking each other a lot of the time. Um, and lots of this as well. So it's quite because people learn to self-medicate, um, as you'll be very aware, I'm sure. High percentage. And of course, adolescence is a, is a tif difficult enough time anyway, um, without adding in the complexities of ADHD and, and um, mental health problems. I'm putting up this slide with some caution because I think it's quite a negative one, but I also think it's important to acknowledge um, we know that as children grow up, children with ADHD are more at risk of these things happening. Behavioural disturbance right from early on, um, academic um, impairment, difficulties with their peers. Um, actually, one of the things I keep hearing consistently from, um, from adults and kids and parents is that, uh, is that people with ADHD will sort of turn themselves into the class clown make people laugh. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way, you know, they might not get some of the social subtleties of, <coughs> of um, peer interactions, which are very complicated for anybody. They might not be able to rein in some of their impulsive behaviours. They might be butting into things, interrupting things, and it won't go down with the kids so well. But if they can make them laugh, and they can make them smile, and they can joke around, then that's sort of, um, that's often their way to fit in. And if you think about how that becomes part of the, the individual's identity, um, because, and that they get, if they get positive feedback, uh, I spoke to a young man who's, um, I do a lot of work in prisons, and I spoke to a young man who was involved in the criminal justice system. He's in his, twen in his 20s, and he said, uh, they didn't like me, they just didn't like me, until I could make them laugh. And I kept doing it, and I kept doing it because they kept laughing, and they seemed to like me. And it sort of it shaped very much how you know himself because he, he said he wasn't like that initially, but he realised that he did something silly or he did something a bit naughty that got you know um, that might get him into trouble that the kids would be more accepting of him because he would be cool. So he then started to work um, basis on the feedback of the other kids and his peers about what would make him be accepted, and I think that comes up a lot in ADHD. Um, and I think this bit here is hugely important when we think about um, how people shape themselves. Because most kids, almost all kids want to fit in with their peers. They want to be liked by their peers. Um, and sometimes that involves behaving in a particular way um, to compensate um, or to try and get people to like them. Smoking as a way to fit in, but also as a way to self-medicate and calm down. Um, we've talked a lot about this already. There's a lot of sort of 
messages to, to young people, to children and young people with ADHD about what they can't do um, and what they should be doing and what they're not doing. Um, and sometimes um, less of the positive stuff. And a lot of this depends on um, things other than outside of school. So, you know, there's some fantastic teachers out there as well, um, but having a supportive environment to make them more resilient. Um, relationship difficulties. A lot of people just go and say, oh, I'm, I'm really unreliable. You know, those things, terms like that have a really negative connotation. Um, and working therapeutically, sometimes people can end up sort of reframing that, saying, okay, um, I'm spontaneous. So they're not the same thing, but there's a sort of more of a positive spin on it, and more um, terms with more positive connotations. And to go from some of the more negative aspects to some of the positive things, um, I think it's really important to have for kids to have positive role models. Because many people um, are talking more about the ADHD, how they have over overcome the challenges, um, the resilience that they've developed as a result of ADHD, um, and how it's defined them. Um, I'm sure you're aware of, people are aware of this? Story yeah. this year, yeah, I'm sure you will be. Um, who's spoken um, spoken about ADHD and taking medication and not something you know, not, not something to be ashamed of. Hello, Jamie. Um, so I do I do think it's very important for kids to have to think about those things as well, and to think actually, yeah, I struggle with these things. There's some really good role models out there who have um, also struggled with the same things that I have, and they've gone to do brilliant things. This is what I was talking about earlier, and I do think um, I do think it's often missed. Um, it was not, there's not enough emphasis on, on the psychoeducation side of ADHD. Um, a lot of a lot of people, um, young people with ADHD, aren't they're able to tell you what ADHD stands for, but if you ask them what it is, um, some people don't know. I mean, it's it's known more generally as a mental health problem, but technically. Uh, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, it's not a mental health problem. Often people present to mental health services because they have additional difficulties um, alongside the ADHD. Um, but it's quite an interesting conversation to have with people. So what do you think ADHD is? If you were to explain it to somebody else, what would you say? And this becomes very important because the young child and young person is an expert on themselves. They know, they will, uh, they can learn to develop to know what helps them as an individual, um, what is useful to them, um, what aspects um, of ADHD they struggle with, um, what bits they might, some people like, and how it fits in with them as a person. Now sometimes people can only just tell you what ADHD is, so it might be that that young person is the person who's explaining this um, to other people in the future. The difference is in, on a bra in the brain, as I talked about earlier, on what, in whatever level somebody can to understand that and access it, I think it's really, really worth looking at. Um, and it's not, you know, it's, I think people can easily jump to this idea of it being um, people saying, oh, you know, it's about an excuse, and it's not, it's not really about that. It's about understanding the differences that are there and what might be different and why some things might feel more dif difficult. It must be really hard as um, a young person to be looking um, at their peers and thinking, why can't I do that? Why is it easy for th that person to do X, Y, Z? And I find it really hard. What does that mean about me? Um, and how that those kind of questions <coughs> impact on what they think about. You know, what happens internally <coughs> in their internal dialogue, the way they speak to themselves? Um, are they internalising the negative messages that other people are saying to them? That they're not good enough? That they should be different? That it, they're not trying hard enough? When actually a lot of the time they really are. So it's, we, we all develop ways of talking to ourselves, um, which can often be quite self-critical. And sometimes we might hear ourselves saying to ourselves, oh, you're so stupid, why did you do that to yourself? But you'd never say that to somebody that you love. You wouldn't say it to your child or <coughs> someone you care about. You'd be much more empathetic, um, much more um, 
much more gentle, really. So it's about teaching um, young people to have something that balances out the negative stuff about what they can't do, what they struggle with. <coughs> Plenty of psychological treatments um, out there that have been developed specifically for ADHD. Um, and, and individual strategies. Again, a lot of times it's working with the kids. You know, people might say to me, um, I, know this, I know this person with ADHD, what will help them? And, you know, there's general strategies that can be helpful, but sometimes it's a case of trying out loads of different things, seeing what works. Um, and sometimes it's not the things that you necessarily expect to work. Will work. I know a lot of people who are now um, very reliant on phone apps and reminders and all of those things, which, be, which has really been quite um, life-changing for some of the people that I've been working with, because they can put the second they think of things. Some people struggle to use um, use those things effectively because of the difficulties they have, but, but for, for many people it's helpful. Um, and without being too um, doom and gloom about it, but to um, educate people about the mental health side of things that people might be more at risk of feeling anxious. If they are struggling with things um, and they're not sure, how, or they're used to getting things um, not, not right, then the long-term impact that no, on their mental health. And it's also about talking to people about things like substance misuse, which so often comes hand in hand with ADHD, um, and the long-term impact of that. Again, working with a, another young person recently, and he said, um, it, I mean, I met him, he, he was just, I actually asked to do an autism assessment for him. And I met him and I thought, wow, if you were to have, I mean, everybody, obviously everybody with ADHD is different. But if you wanted to have a nice textbook example, this would be it for you. It was so, so, so screaming obvious. And he's in his mid-twenties. Um, and he self-medicates all the time with cannabis. Um, and he said, I don't want to take cannabis, I just want to feel calm. So if you could give me something that was legal in a pill that made me feel like cannabis does, I would I'd take it. I don't care that it's cannabis, I don't care that I'm smoking it, I just want to feel calm. And I thought, I wonder what the impact would have been for him if he'd had the diagnosis earlier. Um, again, very, very, very low self-esteem um, because he struggled so much. Another example of somebody who described becoming the class clown, the joker, getting into a bit of a trouble, um, getting drugs for his peers, you know, to make him feel more popular. So, you know, um, not the best of paths for him, but I'm hoping that, 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 that he might find something that he can take that's legal in a pill that's not cannabis. Um, and the positive aspects of ADHD, which I have talked about a lot, um, and the role models as well. Um, I have to say, I, I don't really like to talk about ADHD as a sort of group or a sort of group of patients. I don't like to think of it like that. But, but what I do want to say is when I'm working in the ADHD clinic or therapeutically um, with somebody, what I often feel when I leave the room is very energised and, and I... I really, it is very, very sort of different. I sort of absorb some of the energy, um, creative way of thinking, um, different perspectives on things, and I think I really, really love that about working um, with the condition. Um, of course, that's not to underestimate the challenges and the difficulties, but I think it's so important to have that balance um, of making people aware. And that's you know the card thing I described earlier. That's saying pick the bit, you know, pick the things that you think you are, pick the things, the things that you think you're not. And what do you like about this? And what would you like to be different? Gives them a bit more focus. And the medication, I think, um, anybody who's um, taken any medication for other things that affects your mood and the way you feel, um, I, I do think about the impact on identity for, for that aspect, because I think some people describe feeling like a different person when they take medication. Those things that might um, be more prominent in the way they describe themselves might not be there so much when they take the medication, um, depending on how much they define themselves based on, um, not based on the ADHD symptoms, but based on the personality characteristics which are often associated with that. So if somebody's very, very energetic and then the, the medication makes them calmer, what does that do for their self-concept? Does that make it more difficult to grasp who they are as a consistent person. 
And when you think about things like that, I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important to explain what the medication does, what it does in the brain, how it's not changing who you are, um, it doesn't make you different, a different person fundamentally, um, but it might make the way you behave um, look a bit different for, for the time that you're on the medication. I think I'll probably lay with my point about um, uh, about psychoeducation and knowledge um, already, but um, I do think this is, and I'm actually I'm con constantly surprised by how much kids can take in, how much you can um, they can learn about it, how much insight they have. Um, it's very easy to assume that younger kids um, don't necessarily have the capacity to take on this kind of stuff, but actually there's so many different ways that, that it can be communicated. Um, <coughs> And I think the, reject, the rejection of the ADHD diagnosis when people maybe become more aware of it, if they haven't had that um, understanding um, and they're suddenly faced, oh, you've got this thing, I don't want that thing, it makes me different. Um, it's more difficult for, for people to accept the diagnosis. I just like that picture. It's sort of um, just it sort of just represents what I'm, I'm trying to, to talk about here in terms of people feeling um, positive about themselves, um, feeling empowered, um, and having the knowledge um, of ADHD and what it means for them as an individual and what it is as a condition. I put this slide in because sometimes, uh, this is often how I feel when I'm working with ADHD. I feel energised, um, I feel excited, I enjoy um, working in the area. Um, and I think there's so many wonderful things about it, as well as the many, many struggles and the challenges and the, the difficult sides of it as well. Um, and I do wish more people could, could see the, the great bits.